So why is America so heavily reliant on the Chinese rare earths? The question remains puzzling even in China. Americans have debated their rare earth shortage for more than 15 years, but it's still shocking to see almost no progress made across half a generation. To borrow Mr. Trump's phrasing, China couldn't believe its own luck. The earliest warning came in 2010, when China leveraged rare earth exports during a territorial dispute with Japan. American media erupted with coverage, highlighting a glaring strategic weakness. While the US was capable of mining rare earths, China controlled nearly 90% of the global processing capacity. Without China's processing plants, the EV production lines, precision guidance systems, and even the advanced fighter jets would be paralyzed overnight. The danger was so clear that the House of Cards, the hit Netflix drama show, actually dramatized a scenario which China threatens a rare earth export ban. But despite this cultural wake-up call, the Money Corp, the last US company that was capable of processing rare earths, collapsed in 2015 after losing the competition against Chinese firms. If Washington failed to observe the lesson back in the 2010s, the period from which 2018 to 2020 trade war has delivered such an unmistakable warning, Beijing had explicitly signaled that the rare earth exports could be cut off. From any rational perspective, this was a moment for decisive action. But Washington again failed. There were indeed brief flashes of reversal. People like James Litinsky, the CEO of MP Materials, has made repeated television appearances after 2019 and proclaiming that America would break China's rare earth monopoly. But these aspiring speeches masked an unspoken truth. More than half of the US ore mined still had to be shipped to China for refining, while the rest of it went to Australia to be processed. So that America's supposed rare earth sovereignty was built entirely on the foreign processing infrastructure. Ultimately, the rhetoric evaporated as China and America reached a trade deal in early 2020, removing this critical nature of rare earth shortage. As a consequence, imports of rare earth continued and the US domestic processing capacity stagnated again. During President Biden's four years in office, despite his promise to build back better, there was nearly zero investment in the STEM talent or the industrial R&D that is necessary to revive the domestic processing. There was no multi-agency coordination, and the project choking regulations remained untouched. The total government support amounted to 300 million USD, which is a trivial sum in industrial policy terms. And this stands in a sharp contrast to the semiconductor sector. The CHIPS Act, passed in 2022, authorized around $52.7 billion in subsidies and tax credits for the chip manufacturing. By year 2024, over $32 billion in grants and $29 billion in loans had already been allocated. That is 200 more times than the investment in the rare earths. From an industrial strategy perspective, this imbalance is truly irrational. While the chips themselves contain almost no rare earth materials, the machinery that used to produce them does, like fabrication robots, servo motors, lithography chambers, all depend heavily on the neodymium magnets and other specialized rare earth coatings. America's massive investment in the fabs only created the new dependency by expanding its exposure to minerals which it does not control. So this strategic incoherence becomes even clearer through the lens of the AI race. AI models require vast data centers filled with GPUs, and cooling them requires thousands of high RPM fans that is again built with rare earth magnets. And the US military's vision of this AI-enhanced warfare, from satellite systems to radar areas, rests heavily on the rare earth components. If China just stops exporting rare earths, the US will lose not only the EV motors, but also the technology backbone of its AI-driven military systems. So this flawed industrial planning explains why China had decisively played the rare earth card. America just too dependent, too vulnerable. Ultimately, it had little choice but to compromise. And this raises the deeper question, why did the US walk willingly into such a self-made trap? The answer lies in its deep-rooted addiction to the neoliberal economics. For the last four decades, neoliberalism has taught American policymakers and corporate executives the same doctrine. Specialized where margin are highest, 
outsource the low margin masses of production and let the global markets optimize the rest. That doctrine functions well in the consumer technology, but fails catastrophically when the strategic bottlenecks determine national security. So the semiconductors sit at this glamorous high value end of the supply chain and fits perfectly into this neoliberal worldview because the chips are high growth, high margin, innovation driven, and easy to champion politically. The fabs create headline jobs, the GPU production drives the stock markets, and the CEOs of the chip industry becoming the demigods. Buying the stocks of these starship companies has become a new gospel of prosperity. And investing in the chips produces this instant political mileage. The middle class has also benefited because they cheer on the market rally, while the rich play the best and when will the bubble burst. Even the lower class can get jobs in constructing these massive data centers. On the other hand, the rare earth processing is dirty, is low margin, and is heavily regulated. It offers no Wall Street narrative, no Silicon Valley stardust, and no AI hype. So the result was a structural bias. Subsidize the apex of the tech pyramid, ignore the foundation. America has since been trapped in its own propaganda loop that chips are everything, chips are the future, that chips define the power. That loop has incentivized policymakers to the underlying fragility. Without the rare earths, the entire chip ecosystem basically collapses. The neoliberal ideology has become so blended that American leaders thought China will not utilize its chokehold on rare earths because supposedly they think China is compelled to play by the rules of this global capitalism. But why would China do that if America broke the rules first by seeking to isolate China from global chip supply chains? China has in fact been planning to play a different game from the very beginning. Since the 1980s, as China opens to the world, it began to hone its strategic masterstroke. The Chinese leader back then, Deng Xiaoping, has famously said that the Middle East has oil, but China has rare earths. That is an early recognition that the rare earths are not mere commodities. They are the strategic choke points that can be leveraged just like how OPEC has engineered the oil prices back in 1973. This foresight shaped the national industrial planning. The rare earths were integrated into these long-term economic and military strategies. Learning from America's chip ban, China has executed the coordinated industrial policy. Instead of just fragmenting responsibility across private companies and competing agencies, China has centralized the decision-making process. The state banks has financed the infrastructure in mining regions. The provincial government has coordinated the transport networks linking the mines to the processing plants. And the smaller companies actually were consolidated into larger and more efficient state-backed conglomerates that is capable of achieving scale. So China has essentially vertically integrated the entire supply chain from extraction to separation to manufacturing ensuring that value accumulation happened domestically. By year 2025, China's rare earth supply chain is internally transparent to the Chinese government, with every segment of the supply chain documented and the comprehensive monitoring system put in place. In the times of national emergency, no industrial actor can simply act on their own because every trace of the refined rare earth can be tracked with harsh punishment for any company that violates the export control. So crucially, China has invested heavily in the STEM talent and technical expertise. The Chinese universities have trained more than 120,000 chemical engineers and material scientists each year. And they mastered the separation chemistry and the magnet design, with over 2,000 of them specialized in the rare earth production alone. The Chinese state labs also worked alongside industry on the process optimization and environmental control. An entire ecosystem of talent emerged. Scientists, technicians, engineers, they are all capable of maintaining, expanding, and modernizing the rare earth processing capacity. Such STEM workforce would take America decades to match, even as China's population ages. This is a structural asymmetry at the heart of the rare earth crisis. China planned, invested, 
coordinated and trained its way into a position of dominance. America, on the other hand, outsourced, deregulated, and financialized its way into dependence. And now in this age of AI, that dependence has become a strategic liability that even trillion dollar investment in the chips cannot compensate for. This is Curtis, and thanks for watching. Till next time.